In this penultimate lesson, which examines the First World War, what we're going to do is talk about the Spring Offensive and the 100 days which followed. Now, essentially, this is going to be uh, some of the last major military developments which take place in 1918, in the final year of the First World War. Now, the Spring Offensive takes place first, hence uh, being in spring, towards the start of 1918 and then it is followed by the hundred days which then culminates in the ending of the first world war or at least the events that lead up to the ending of the first world war which includes the the german revolution which includes the abdication of the kaiser the armistice and then the establishment of the weimar republic within germany so essentially when we get into the final year of the first world war and we start to talk about 1918 for both sides, the essential situation was very, very dire. Um, things were much worse for Germany, as we will get to in a minute, um, who had become essentially desperate as a result of a number of different uh, things that were done on the part of the Allied side, the, 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 uh, the British and the, the, the US and the French. And to an extent, uh, the the Russian Empire, but of course the Russian Empire, as we know, uh, sort of takes a step out of the, the First World War in 1917 with their revolution um, that takes place when, in, in February and, uh, and October. So essentially what we have for Germany in terms of the situation going into 1918 was the fact that they were stuck with the Allies blockading resources, so we mentioned this earlier in previous lessons, as well as the fact that the United States has now officially joined and entered the war. Not only have they just entered the war, but they have also now started to ramp up their military capabilities and actually managed to have some kind of impact on the war. So while the United States joined the war in 1917, it wasn't really until 1918 that we start to see the USA actually have some kind of measurable impact on the First World War. These were not offset by the impact of the Russian Revolution. So the Russian Revolution and the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk and the, the surrender of the Russian Empire was a positive for, for Germany, as you can probably imagine. It meant that they could focus more of their resources on the Western Front rather than trying to split resources on both sides. The, the fact that the Russian Revolution was a success does not offset the fact that they were still being blockaded and the fact that the United States had now entered the war. So it essentially went from a quite worn out and relatively economically inferior state like the Russian Empire uh, surrendering to now a new fresh opponent essentially being found in the United States. There was also the fact that the Allies were making significant military and equipment advantages as well. So, for example, the US were sending troops to France at a rate of around 50,000 per month. There's supposed to be an extra zero on the end of that. Um, and so, of course, this is just a pouring in of resources that Germany essentially could not match since Germany had been at war since 1914 and had been suffering significant and heavy losses alongside the Allies. The United States had not been at war since 1914, and so as a result of that, it means that the US can now send more of these fresh troops to France and to Europe to help uh, support and bolster the Allied fronts. They were also sending tanks and heavy guns, so we are starting to see new equipment being added to the capabilities of the Allies as well. The British were also developing their, their military with the introduction of the Royal Flying Corps, the RFC. Now, this would increase to a size of over 20,000 aircraft by October 1918. So, by the end of the war, essentially, in 1918 we see the, uh, the, the the British Royal Flying Corps being quite a significant military force. Now, of course, the Royal Flying Corps will eventually be uh, be transferred and renamed into the RAF, okay? The, 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 uh, and essentially what we have at this point is just uh, significant technological advantages in the sense that um, it was really the First World War that we start to see the, the, the weaponization of flying uh, aircraft of aircraft against enemy uh, against enemy forces so with this being set as the sort of background to the start of 1918 
What happens next is something that is relatively successful on the part of Germany, but it comes at a very heavy cost. And this is the Spring Offensive of 1918. And essentially what this was, was the last attempt, uh, the, final, the, the final hurrah, if you, uh, if you will, um, for Germany to try and win the war in any way possible. It was almost like, um, if we're going to make some kind of analogies to the Second World War, it's like the Battle of the Bulge. Essentially a, a one last Hail Mary to try and essentially um, change the tide, turn the tide at any point they could. And it began in March of 1918 when German commander uh, Ludendorff uh, launched a major offensive. This was the Spring Offensive and it was relatively successful because what it led to was the Germans being able to break the Allied lines and advancing around 64 kilometers into the, the, in, in, into the Allied territories. They advanced so far that in fact Paris was in the range of heavy artillery. If you remember back to the start of the First World War, the start of these lessons when we looked in 1914, how close uh, the, the German Empire managed to get to Paris, well, they managed to get relatively close again because now Paris was once again in the range of heavy artillery. So this is the success of the Spring Offensive. It was successful in that regard. It was successful at breaking through the enemy lines, reaching 64 kilometers deep into the Allied territory and getting as close as that to Paris that which they could actually be able to fire heavy artillery on the city. So this was relatively successful on the one hand, but of course it came at a very heavy cost. Uh, over 400,000 soldiers, German soldiers, had been killed in the process, and there weren't any reserves that they could rely upon. So this war of attrition that we focused on in previous lessons, specifically looking at, for example, the Battle of Verdun, um, could not be relied upon anymore because they, the, the, the whole point of the war on attrition was the fact that you could just simply pour more men and resources into the fight and essentially wait until the opposite side capitulates. Well, this couldn't happen when you haven't got any more people to rely upon. So the loss of 400,000 German soldiers in 1918 was a significantly more detrimental impact than it would have been in 1914. And so as a result of this, what follows is the 100 days, which takes us from May to August of 1918. And during this period, there were very little developments on the part of the German military. And by this point, the USA and Allied forces were well equipped with an increased manpower and new military technologies. Remember, 50,000 uh, uh, soldiers being poured into Europe every single month uh, uh, as a result of the United States entering the war continues across this 100 days. And on the 8th of August of 1918, what the Allies did was launch their major counterattack against the German forces. And this was a success on the part of the Allies, as you can probably imagine, a very well-equipped, new, uh, invigorated military force with the USA uh, at the helm, essentially. This essentially became the, known as the Black Day for the German army because it was such a significant blow to their military capabilities. For those in the military on both sides, it became clear that it was only going to be a matter of time for the German military um, before they would eventually capitulate and have to surrender. And essentially, this is really where we get to um, the point of September 1918. Because by September 1918, the Allies had reached what was known as the Hindenburg Line. And by October, uh, the German military were in full retreat. So this really sets the stage for what happens next, going, from Oct going into October and November of 1918, where we see the collapse of the German Empire, we see the abdication of Kaiser Wilhelm II, and we see the establishment uh, later on, after a surrender, uh, we then see the establishment of the Weimar Republic, which then takes us into uh, uh, 1919 and into uh, essentially the, the, the period of the Weimar Republic, the Treaty of Versailles, etc., etc., etc. So we'll get to those events in the next lesson.